Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bhagam Radian here in Orlando, Florida, where we're covering the Air Force Association's annual Air Warfare Symposium. Our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS, and it's our pleasure to be talking again to YouTube star and snack food aficionado, Sean Warren, uh, who is the Vice President for uh, the big military engines uh, at uh, General Electric. I should also tell people that General Electric Marine is uh, one of our uh, naval uh, sponsors. Sean, great seeing you again. Great, always great to see you. Uh, pleasure. Uh, you and I uh, had a chance to talk at the Air Force uh, Association's uh, big show last year in uh, September. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about where we are on the program, right? Every one of the contractors who mm -hmm. look, was looking for the B-52 re-engineering contract has gone through a process, uh, an integration study, months-long integration study with Boeing. Talk to us about what some of the uh, outputs from that were. Yeah, yeah so uh, great. Um, we have two engines on the competition. We just wrapped up the integration study, just did the outbriefs with Boeing and the Air Force a few weeks ago. It was really a great opportunity for us to go study uh, the integration aspects of both engines. I think we came out feeling really good about both of our products there and the ability to go meet the requirements and integrate into the aircraft. And I think it was a great opportunity for us to learn through the process. I think as some of the engines walking in, I think Boeing had one perception of the engines and it really gave us an opportunity to work together and answer some of their questions. And I think we both uh, walked away feeling like those products can go meet the requirements and integrate easily into the aircraft. And, and one of the things that this uh, integration study did right was was validate the claims you were making right mm -hmm. I mean there you know everybody can say like hey I'm given 30 percent extra fuel burn and efficiency yep. what are some of the validated uh, statements you can make now in terms of you know where you guys are in terms of the performance and the suitability of the engine yeah so we had the opportunity to go like at fuel burn is a one specific example we validated you know passport in that 30 percent range from a fuel burn standpoint CF 34 is more in the low 20 range when it comes to fuel burn based on the b52 missions but we looked at power extraction requirements, validated that we can meet both thresholds and really what the objectives are in the program there. And then just what are the other sort of schedule risk type items as we've talked to some of the Air Force leaders as much as they talked about the requirements and even price, Another thing that came up multiple times is schedule, right? We really need this program to go execute on schedule. So how long do you think it will go take to go meet the requirements here? Yeah. Uh, and, and tell the audience, right? I mean, you guys are unique in that you do have two offerings mm -hmm. that you're bringing to the party. Give us just a quick update on the two engines that are competing for it and their relative advantages yes, so the audience so. has yeah, a sense. So we have two great engines kind of at two different spectrums. We have the CF-34-10, so over 1,600 engines in service, over 30 million hours of operation. So if you're looking for a proven reliability. The CF-34 is it. We're getting 20,000 hours time on wing on the products in the field. If you're looking for the more high-tech product, we have the other end of the spectrum, which is the Passport. So recently went into service, longest uh, flight on a purpose-built uh, business jet, over 8,200 nautical miles. Best fuel burn in its class. The other great thing about our two products is they're at the high end of the thrust range here, 19,000 pounds on the Passport, 20,000 pounds on the CF-34. So as you go through the requirements and evaluation you know, aircraft requirements always move around. We've got a lot of capability, both from a power uh, extraction standpoint and thrust, to be able to meet all the requirements across the flight envelope. Uh, I, you, you know you're talking to an engine engineer when he's talking about power extraction, <laughs> given that all well, all the accessories, right, are a drain right, on, the, yeah. on, the, on, the, on the power of each of the engines. So what's uh, next, right? You guys are, so we'll give, give us a sense on what's next mm -hmm. as far as your guys' timeline to get this over the finish line. Yeah, so the next step really right now is just to prepare for the final RFP. We're actually expecting another version of the draft RFP and some industry Q&A uh, along with that. You know, from what we're hearing now, the RFP could be as early as end of March or sometime in the second quarter time period there, and then all the competitors will uh, go in and put in their proposals. And then we'll actually spend some time after we submit the proposals, continuing to build on the integration efforts that we did in the first study so that we can compress the cycle and once an engine selection is made, we can go hit the ground running. Um, you're uh, an engineer, you're very passionate about this business of flight and of, of uh, engines. Um, Talk to us a little bit about how you guys are bringing a new generation in. There isn't a contractor that's not concerned about bringing in a new generation of talent. A lot of the guys who worked in this industry for a long time are retiring. Some of those guys were from the Cold War and Space Age buildup, uh, in fact, who are in uh, some of these jobs, whether they were in management or in online engineering. What are some of the things you guys are doing to bring a whole new generation in so that the Sean Warrens of the future are already in the pipeline? Yeah. So I think it is a great question there, especially as you look at kind of the age of some of the uh, engineers or other just really experience that we've had on the military side. And we have really seen a 
growth uh, and really um, a rebirth, if you will, in just sort of engine programs as we go look here, which naturally requires a new level of engineering talent. So we've got a lot going on with universities, but we're also trying to figure out how we go in, bring in experienced talent, right? And then you have programs like the XA100, which is not under me, but uh, in the GE portfolio there, where we get to develop the next generation of talent. We get to bring the engineers in. Engineering is all about problem solving, so it's an opportunity to both develop technology, think creatively about how you solve uh, different programs. You know, one of the messages we've been giving out to a lot of the Air Force leaders is, when you think about industrial base, you typically think about it from a manufacturing standpoint and when you make parts, but the industrial base is just as important when it comes to the quality of the engineering talent, right? And you really want to have all of the OEMs continuing to develop fifth gen, sixth gen, and seventh gen technologies as we move to the future. So we're really looking forward to the XA100 program continuing to move forward and allowing our engineers to go develop that next generation of talent. And, you know, if that program eventually translates into a production program, an opportunity to field a six-gen type product in the marketplace. So how, let me ask you one thing, we're both proud New Yorkers, we both got excited in this when we were kids, the moon landings to me was like the big thing that got me into it, but there was a Cold War that was going on. You know, how young were you when you had that spark, and how important are state, state and local education programs to direct kids and keep them in a STEM pipeline, right? I mean, there isn't a, a kid that doesn't get excited about some of this stuff, but the question is staying power yeah. as opposed to going and being like, oh, wait a minute, the same math skills would also be good for me on Wall Street or in business. Yeah, so as a native New Yorker, what really fascinated me was the bridges. That was what got me hooked on engineering. As you drive around New York, there's all kinds of bridges everywhere, the fascinating structures, and then you start imagining, well, how do they actually construct these structures? And, you know, especially if you go back to the time frame and the engineering challenges for how you would go build a bridge over there. So that was what got me hooked. And I had the benefit of going to a STEM program when I was in actually middle school that was really focused on getting kids interested in engineering. So we went up to Clarkson University for a week. We learned about all the different engineering disciplines and bridge building competition and some other things. And so that really is what got me hooked. And then I happened to go to Brooklyn Tech High School in New York, which is all about uh, engineering and you get to pick a major. And so I've sort of been on that track since about eighth grade and have been hooked ever since. Uh, exactly, and I should say I'm a Hunter graduate, so it's always good to meet a Brooklyn Tech guy, uh, yeah. part of uh, Stuyvesant and Bronx Science uh, as well. Sean, always a pleasure. Thanks very much. Best of luck in the competition. Looking right. forward to continuing the conversation and seeing you in sunny Cincinnati for a bowl of chili soon. <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward to it. Yeah.